one of your posts, you said the biggest hurdles are there's no people, there's no leaders, and there's no capital. <laughs> That's quite a hurdle to overcome. It certainly is, yeah. And those words came from um, a woman working in farming in the Nakatsugawa community when we did a little workshop about, uh, well, what path do you, can you draw me a map of your future in this community? Um, what does the future look like and what are the obstacles on that path to the future? And uh, she wrote in English in, in the corner of the map, no people, no leaders, no capital. Um, and ever since then, that's just been there in my very much, in my, uh, I've been very conscious of this, whatever, whatever I'm doing out there is if you don't deal with those problems, you're not going to make any progress sustainably. So, um, so what would be the first thing to deal with? The leaders or the people or the capital? Well, I think the interesting thing is that the leaders exist. Yeah. But they're furiously multitasking out there uh, because they have their competent people. Yeah. Um, so the people who really should be taking a strategic, well, thinking about the village or the community strategically are driving the bus. They're working behind the uh, reception desk at the local onsen. They're doing this, that and the other. They're so busy every day that they just don't have time to raise their eyesight to the horizon. Yeah. Um, and uh, so if you can actually provide them with a little bit of leeway and breathing space in their everyday life, I think they'll start to function again as leaders. Um, so creating a possibility for the leaders to function as leaders is possibly one of the keys. And then the other thing is you need to bring in the people. Yeah, you, you mentioned working with jets. Hmm. And I've also been talking to other people about traveling volunteers. Mm. Would there be any support to the rural areas by bringing in people as English speaking volunteers like jets to donate their time, travelers to donate their time to come and support the local people as who are acting as leaders, but so busy with all the, the operations, like you said, I wonder if there's some no. future there. I think so. Um, one of the key facilities for me in a, a village is uh, the presence or the absence of uh, Nor Kaminshku, so farmhouse B&B. &B. Um, I don't know what things are like in Hiroshima. I'm sure that you've got uh, some really nice farmhouse B&Bs. Have you actually? Tell me. No. no? I don't really? think so. Not that I know of. I know a few people are trying to start something like that. Hmm. Um, it's definitely got so much potential. Hmm. You know, that's, that's where you can really get people out to the rural areas and enjoy traditional Japanese culture in a beautiful farmhouse, right? But it has to be comfortable. It has to be renovated up to a certain extent, right? Have you been working on projects to renovate farmhouses? Well, actually not renovation. I just take them as they are for the time being because they're a starting point. Um, so this little village, Nakatsugawa, has now only about 280 people. So the population has been dropping over the years that I've been associated with it. Um, That's really low. And in this community of 280 people, they have eight farmhouse B&Bs. Oh, wow. Right now. Uh, it used to be more, but uh, the people who are running the farmhouse B&Bs are typically, uh, well, an elderly man and woman. Uh, uh -huh. The woman tends to be uh, the person who takes the, uh, the does the most in, uh, in that um, sphere of activity. And... Um, so when you stay at a place like that, you have an opportunity to speak with somebody who's um, been in that community probably their whole life, um, who has been growing vegetables in their back garden probably their whole life. Uh, so you have the support of the local vegetables. So there is local produce, local foods there to enjoy, as well as having the B&B. So you have those two amazing resources. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's just lack of staff, right? Staff Part, lack of staff and the language barrier. So okay. if you're going to bring um, uh, English speakers into that environment, they won't have a clue what's going on. They'll, in, they'll right, probably right. enjoy the food, but they won't really know what they're eating. Yeah. Um, and actually knowing what they're eating and how it's prepared is one of the great pleasures of uh, experiencing it. Um, and then if you have a solution to the language problem, mm -hmm. uh, you start to learn about the incredible lives many of these people have been leading. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the farmhouse B&Bs in Akatsugawa, um, uh, one of their, the foods that you eat there is bear meat, which is pretty unusual anywhere. Um, and usually it doesn't taste very good, but there it tastes fantastic. But the, 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 um, the man and a man and a woman run the place. The man is a bear hunter. Um, and uh, he, some years ago, went out into the, uh, the mountains uh, 
on his own. In the old days, they go out as a group, but of course the population has dropped. So he was on his own in the mountains looking for bears in the early spring, very, very deep snow still. He uh, broke his leg in the middle of the mountains, no phone signal. And he walked five hours back into the village with a broken leg. Um, and uh, his wife then made a Kamishibai story about this whole thing. Is when you stay at that farmhouse B&B, she'll give you the, the uh, Kamishibai story. So Kamishibai, what do we say in English for that? Uh, sort of like a paper, a paper puppet, paper lantern story. Yeah, paper, kind of thing, it's yeah. something like, like a silhouette, silhouette oh, story. Yeah, with is drawing, so it's like little manga. Oh, but oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so she pulls away another one, there's an next frame. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, paper puppets, maybe? Uh, it's not even puppets because it's just okay. it's just drawn, you know? Uh, but anyway, so uh, uh, that it makes the, the whole experience of staying in Akatagawa completely, it transforms it. Um, but then in other places, you'll have other stories about hardship and success and failure and all kinds of very interesting things to learn about, some of them tragic. Um, about uh, how the community has dwindled from what it was, uh, you know, say three or four decades ago, yeah. the role that a dam might play in that kind of thing. And have you have you worked with them or worked with any volunteers to get that story onto video with English subtitles? I mean, even starting from that point, and ha that helps promote the rural area, but it also gives some background. So people who visit there would already have seen that story. So maybe if they see it live again, they know the basic the storyline. So that that would be another way to not only promote, but to also keep the heritage of the area. Mm. Um, even you know, if you do it on your phone these days, the quality is is good enough, you know, to put on YouTube and and start getting the word out. I know, you know, there's all these resources that people like you who work in the rural communities know the people. You you know all this information. It's finding the way to promote it to people on the outside to really get people coming in. But I'm sure you've tried loads of different different ways to get people to come. I'd love to talk about that as well. Yes. Yeah, so what we do now and what I was doing in Akatsugawa just a couple of weeks ago, we did it last year too, is we have trainees from a Japanese company. So these are Japanese trainees and they need to speak English at work. Uh, but in many cases, they have very little confidence in their communication skills. Um, and uh, so on this occasion, five of them came to Nakatsugawa and their task on day one was to speak with the local grandfathers and grandmothers, find out about the challenges of the community, the beautiful aspects of the community, and um, just gather information. And so that's where we're getting in the kind of information. English. In Japanese. They're doing that in Japanese. Okay. And on, on day two, foreigners arrive. And okay. it is then the, the job for the trainees is to show the foreigners around in English. Uh-huh. Um, and so they have a real reason for communicating in English because that's, they've that's just a fantastic met, idea. Good job. Well, they've just met a fabulous granny the day before, and she's uh -huh. standing right there, for example, and she's just saying, Tell them about the plants in my garden. And people who believe they can't speak English will start getting English out because uh -huh. they don't want to let granny down. Um, and I found that this is a very kind of healthy social context uh, for people to find their feet in communicating in English. They'll get something across. The English speakers will be very, very happy to learn that this is something that is grown only here and it's a bit different over in Fukushima and so on. Even these tiny little pieces of, well, information that might not seem valuable make the village come to life for the visitors. That's fantastic. Yeah, what a great idea. And it makes communication in English real. Yes. It, it's, it's so real and useful and needed and necessary. And by using English, these Japanese staff who normally maybe hate using English at work are, are finding an extra capability of using English communication for, for real purpose and to help in hospitality. That's an awesome idea. Good job. Well, the other thing about this, which and a lot of this was accidental. Quite a lot of this was not planned, but uh, various good things started coming out of it. And uh, so what actually happens on day three is that the trainees and the foreign visitors get together on an equal footing, thinking about the future of the village. So we've heard about all of the challenges. Um, we can see that it's a very, very, things are looking pretty bleak 
But can we make any suggestions that would help uh, this community to move towards a slightly brighter future? And again, it's a, a context for real communication with a lot of commitment. Um, and again, um, people do not hesitate to communicate in that kind of environment when they feel that they're speaking on behalf of the community for the benefit of the community. Um, and so I've been trying to uh, create um, a training program where that would be the central element. You actually spend three days in a rural community, but then you spend time in Tokyo before going there or another city, um, making sure that you have the basic tools in order to be able to communicate when you get out there. And then after you come back, you follow up. And uh, ultimately take the, the best ideas back to the community and say, well, look, this time we came up with these ideas. Are there any that you can implement? And they'll probably say, well, you've given us 10 ideas, nine of them are completely useless, but we can try that one. Uh, so you ultimately have to rely on the people on the ground to find um, what they can do and what they can't do. Because outsiders will always suggest things that um, in many cases are just not practical for the local community. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be useful having other long-term residents from Japan who have worked in rural communities, who have seen what works in other rural communities around Japan. So just taking people from Tokyo who, Japanese people, but they've never lived in the rural areas or foreigners who are visiting who've also never lived in rural Japan. So getting, getting more international residents who know the rural areas involved, that, that might be a bit more meaningful and more practical in terms of um, solutions that they might try and things like that, right? No, absolutely. Um, and actually, I was just doing a um, training yesterday um, at a company in Tokyo. I put that photograph up on Facebook, which you liked about. Uh, I love that. Yeah, beautiful. Bit, you know, that bamboo uh, work, anyway. But um, uh, and as part of that training, I talk about what I'm doing in in uh, rural Japan. So let me just quickly show you a photograph of the kind of people that we go out to um, Nakatsugawa with. So. Um, I don't know how clear that's going to be. Uh huh. But, yeah, I can see yeah. it. So we've got a guy who is uh, in charge of a, an American company in Tokyo. Uh, we've got a, a, a British journalist. We've got a CIR from the JET program. Uh huh. We've got a, a teacher at a, an international school in Yokohama, a business consultant, uh, somebody who runs an IT company in Tokyo, and their children and their relatives. So you've got a range of ages. You've got. Um, people from many, many different types of uh, background, experience, expertise. Uh, some of them know the countryside, some of them don't. Yeah. Uh, but that kind of diversity yeah, uh, definitely. makes all the difference. And uh, what I tell the people when I'm speaking in these training programs, this is one of the key things down here is Enyo no Nasa. So what the, the foreign visitors bring in is no hesitation to do stuff, say stuff. They just say it. Either they notice something, they react. They do not hesitate. Whereas if you have just a Japanese group, they will be very hesitant to raise a point in some cases. So the foreigners are this amazing catalyst. Quite a lot of what they say just cannot be used. It's actually, you know, it, it, it it's a, might be a ridiculous idea in some cases. But the Japanese then react and say, oh, well, actually, there's this problem with it. And it, it, again, it engenders this real communication. Definitely. So, and I, I, I think you've probably found that when you take groups of Japanese office staff out to work with locals and stuff, whenever I've taught groups of Japanese people, especially business people, they always defer to the person who has the highest ranking in terms of waiting to say something or you're, you're talking about hesitation. Mm -hmm. But when you bring in international residents or international visitors, they don't have that social hierarchy right. you know, to defer to. So they will just more openly say their ideas or, or comments. So maybe even mixing those groups can free up the Japanese participants of that social hierarchy kind of barrier to communication. I'm sure you found that, right? That's an exceptionally important point. It's, it's another thing that we cover in the training is um, uh, because in Japan you have this very rigid sense of the teacher is out there in front and the, the, the students are following behind. So what I say is you've got to mix them up. You've got the, the sensei and the seto, and mm -hmm. you have to mix them up yeah. uh, so that in each moment somebody else becomes the teacher, some, we all become the students, and then somebody else becomes the teacher. So if you don't have that dynamic um, yeah. learning context, uh, people will get stuck in these old frames of reference. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think as, as someone from Britain as well, um, mm. 
you also have kind of hierarchy depending on what school you went to or what university degree you have, right? I mean, it's it does happen in our societies as well. Oh, I think there are various ways of organizing people so that, you know, someone thinks they're superior to somebody else in one way or another. Yeah. Um, I think it's um, part of the human condition. Uh, but um, it's much more interesting from my point of view as a human to be in a context where you can learn from everybody around you because the, the social arrangements make that possible. Definitely. Uh, and then you discover how much you can learn. Yeah. Um, that everybody brings something to the conversation. Absolutely. No matter what age or anything. So it sounds like you've you've done a great job to create a mix, a very diverse mix of people who can then openly communicate. That's great. Yeah, I think that um, it, nevertheless, it's only really just started. And what I would love to be able to do is when, to... When did you start this? Sorry, was well, that this year? For the first two years after 2014, I was using government money to essentially test various ideas. And what I've just been describing was the output of those two years. Oh, okay. Um, what happened to me over those two years was I, I formed a very strong attachment to that community. Right. Um, and so when the government money ran out, as it were, um, I thought, well, I can't just stop uh, because uh, things are just beginning to start working. Right. Um, and so I've been engaging with the community ever since. And so I had to develop some kind of sustainably profitable business mechanism to yeah. keep being there in this corporate training seemed like the best candidate. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is to take that to other parts of Japan. Right. Wonderful. And that, that brings me to a really interesting point I think many of us social entrepreneurs are struggling with. How do you do good work and make enough money to fund what you need to do as part of your career, right? That's all, also such a hurdle. Um, I was talking to Sarah Jean Rosito yesterday, yeah. and she, you know, she's really active, social engagement, that kind of stuff. Very similar kind of social entrepreneurship. Many similarities to you. I, I see you've worked with people with disabilities other causes over the years, um, working with NGOs, NPOs in Japan. Um, so finding that balance of, of doing what you're passionate about doing to help the community, but also you have to find a way to fund what you're doing. And um, sometimes that's really hard because the, the concept of if it's good for society, if it's good for the environment, it should be free or done voluntarily. That That's a big hurdle, I think, in Japan, particularly. Have you found that, like, difficulty in getting funded? Uh, yes, uh, it is a very uh, difficult challenge. Um, and uh, I suspect, and what I'm hoping to be doing over the, the coming months, um, is that uh, the foreign business community uh, may well provide a stepping stone to the Japanese business community in this context. So although I've been focusing mainly on Japanese trainees, uh, because I wanted to find out if what I thought would happen would happen, which is that they could communicate in English in that kind of context, there's a great deal for uh, people from other countries to learn by going out into the countryside as well. Um, this, if I could just briefly give a bit of the, the kind of the philosophical background here, which uh, connects also to... Um, the, uh, these days, of course, people are uh, very focused on the SDGs, and there's no problem with that. The Sustainable yeah. Development Goals um, are very, very important uh, points of reference. And um, I wouldn't want to deny that in any way. But what I've discovered out in the countryside is that you have these little pieces of thinking about, uh, for example, in Japanese, you might say, taske uh, shikumi, so just mechanisms for collaboration or cooperation. Um, which have been underpinning um, the sustainability of uh, regional communities since the Edo period um, in Japan. So 300, 400 years, these communities have been held together by people essentially bearing in mind what other people in the community can, community can offer and mm -hmm. how you can collaborate to survive. And it was that extreme in a place like Tohoku is if we do not cooperate, we're gonna mm -hmm. die. Yeah. Um, and so um, you really needed to extract all of the potential expertise and experience in the community to enable the community to keep going. Um, and that generated many types of thinking, which um, in fact, there's a professor at uh, a university in Tokyo who's uh, identified 44 of these values, uh, traditional values, which he says are now disappearing very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. disappearing under the kind of the glaring sun of convenience. 
So as soon as you put convenience, make it available in, in these little communities, people will use it to essentially avoid what they had to do in the past. Right. Um, and so there's no longer any strong need to think about the position of other people in the community. That starts to wither away. People will get in their car. They'll drive away to the city. They won't come back. Um, so a great deal of what was built up over the years in those communities is being shattered as we speak. Um, and we are able now to access the thinking of the last generation of people who inherited uh, that way of thinking their average age is probably 90 and over. Uh, but in Japan, you've got more 100 year olds than any or and over than any other country in the world. So there are still loads and loads of people all over Japan that we can speak with, but they can tell us about life before convenience. And uh, the path ahead, we may encounter inconvenience and it's something that we're not accustomed to in this day and age. We uh, have been walking along the road of convenience for two or three or four generations now. And uh, if we suddenly hit a roadblock, which is inconvenience, we're going to find it difficult to cope. But they lived with inconvenience every single day. And they know. are the key to also the plastic problem that we're having, the need to reuse everything. There's so many components of life before convenience that we need to get back to, you know, mm. so there's there's so many lessons there for sure. Yes. And it's the future. Yeah. Uh, it's also universal. So you've got all of these different ecosystems, all kinds of different agricultural practices. Every village has its own story in Japan. It's one of the amazing things about this country. Yeah. But that professor found that these 44 values apply to all of these communities all over Japan. And That's he's even been to places like Laos. What, what's his things. name? The professor's name? Do it's, you... it's, uh, Furukawa Ryuzo. Okay. Ryuzo. He's, uh, he's at Todai, is he? No, he's at uh, Tokyo Shito Daigaku. So Tokyo Metropolitan University is in English. I think I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, but he used to be with a, a big uh, think tank. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he himself was backcasting. He was trying to imagine what life was going to be like in 50 years. And he kept hitting this convenience barrier. Yeah. He was thinking, well, if these resources are running out, if we're heading in the direction of less convenience, how are we going to cope? And right. he just didn't see a way past it. So he thought, well, who can tell me? Oh, people who lived a life without convenience in the old days. That's brilliant. Mm, it really is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's kind of like the DNA of sustainable communities everywhere. Yeah. And and you're not only documenting their strategies for survival before convenience, but you're also documenting their heritage, their culture, the richness of life, you know, before this convenient lifestyle that we know it, which is so valuable to society, but also really valuable to attracting visitors to Japan in general. Because... Yep. Visitors are interested in heritage. They want to know that Japan has a long, rich history. It's not just about manga and anime and modern culture, right? It's it's much deeper and more yeah. important. Absolutely, yeah. And so I would really welcome the opportunity to work with people like you who know about other parts of Japan um, to essentially roll out this system. But we've just one of the things that, as you say, it's just so difficult to find companies that will get solidly behind it yeah. with the kind of funding that it requires. And it does require quite a lot of money. Um, yeah. But if we can say, well, we can train your Japanese employees, we can um, uh, facilitate the learning of. Well, for example, a lot of people come to Japan to work for two or three years at a, a company based in another country. And they, they may spend all of that time in Tokyo and actually not know very much about Japanese culture at all. And right. so a lot of things that happen in everyday life just end up being puzzling uh, and frustrating. Uh, but if they were to spend some time receiving orientation on retreats in places like Hiroshima or in this place in Yamagata, it would make thing it would make more sense to them. Ah, so now I understand what's going on. Um, and I think that could be very valuable simply for staff motivation, just general well-being yeah. uh, in their life in Japan. Yeah, so definitely. I think that the whole world could benefit from this kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, we were talking about a project recently about training guides. Recently, all of the hotels popping up everywhere because of the tourist boom are also advertising local guides. Mm. And so one of the things that we can provide as long term international residents is training guides. Mm. But I, I think I will definitely apply more of the concepts that you've been doing, taking Japanese people as part of training into the rural areas 
getting them to interact with locals there and then explain in English because they're trying to be guides, um, mm -hmm. explain not only linguistically, but culturally and, you know, personally to the local people about the depth of the experience available outside the city centers. And mm -hmm. in that way, we could really do a lot of good as mm -hmm. well as get some income because the hotels would be funding that kind of training to get better quality guides, which increases the amount of income they can get by attracting more visitors to their hotel. Because after next year, after 2020, when this big tourism boom might decrease, I mean, it might not, but for certain cities around Japan that aren't doing hospitality as well as other cities, they will definitely suffer. And the number of tourists to that area because of social media and people's feedback, uh, this wasn't very good, people will stop going there. So the key is now, this year and next year, during this big boom when everybody has too many tourists anyway, no matter what you do, is to really help interested hotels, interested businesses who are interested in doing it well, mm. to do it well. Mm. And then they will be more sustainable over time and have more benefit for society mm. and environment, hopefully. So tell me about the training that you do already. So what do you do so with it? This is just an idea that has been um, something we've been approached for from hotels. Um, they're just starting to think about uh, having guide services for the hotel customers. So it's something that we're pitching to hotels, especially new hotels in our area, that we can offer a guide training program. So mm -hmm. I'll definitely include visits and training in rural areas to try to encourage more tourists to get out to the rural areas but also to more deeply and more effectively train the guides to have a higher quality guide experience in general even if they stay in the city center but they have stories from the rural areas that's still a huge advantage for the visitor and for the local area right you know Mitarai, don't you Mitarai on the island out there have you ever been there Mitarai, I've been out there. I haven't been recently, mm. but I, are they doing something with guiding? Uh, no, there's actually uh, there's somebody on the JET program out there. Um, uh, sorry, not on the JET program. Chikyo Koshi So uh, um, I can't remember how they translate that into English, but it's uh, local community support staff. Uh -huh. uh, so young people who spend uh, two or three years with a particular uh, community, um, again, uh, well, supporting their future uh, development. Uh, but in many cases, um, that doesn't work out because the local community doesn't really understand how to interact with somebody who's just arrived from outside. And the right. person from the outside doesn't know how to interact with that community. Yeah. Uh, um, and you hear these very sad stories of people who just get have two years of wasted time yeah. um, being asked to do very menial tasks because there's no strategy in place. Yes. Uh, but um, uh, the person who is the chiki or koshi kyoryokutai, um, is uh, the is her husband is um, uh, the son of a friend of mine. So he his mother was Japanese, father is British, and they're living together in in Mitarai. They bought a house there now, so their commitment to that community is very strong. Um, and it's exactly the kind of community where they have fascinating stories of the old days. Um, and in a place like Hiroshima, you have these fascinating stories connected with the sea, with island life. And then you can go up into the mountains and have a completely different story about what yeah. life was like up in the mountains. That's so true. Um, so you've got uh, Hiroshima is another of these places. It's a, it's an entire country in one prefecture. Yeah. Um, with an incredible range of experience, and a lot of these stories are simply not being heard. Yeah, um, that's so true. So uh, something I, with them would be. I hope you're not you're not finding this, but um, Hiroshima is famous for also being very conservative and mm. not really being that eager to try new things and stuff. So I, I have found a lot more enthusiasm when I visit like Tokushima mm. or other rural communities around Japan. And uh, so it seems like companies out in Shikoku area or even in Kyushu, they seem more proactive in the way that they want to develop in a sustainable way, either to include tourism and balance the needs of the environment and, and local communities with rich culture and, 
and uh, supporting social equity, as well as making changes to reduce waste and have renewable energy. So I, I've definitely had some trouble <laughs> trying to get my enthusiasm across. And I don't know if it's just my bad luck and the, the people I've met in Hiroshima, but I, I'm encouraged by your activities so much in other areas of Japan. And whenever I travel to places yeah. like Kamikatsu, which already has that zero waste yeah. initiative from 2003. Mm. So people in that local community, they've already gotten over the hurdle of trying something so radical and so hard yeah. as to have no garbage pickup, no incinerator, no landfill, that mm. people there are already kind of trained to think outside the box and yeah. okay, what can we do to develop it further? Okay, maybe tourism is a good way, maybe sustainable tourism. Yeah, let's think about that. And they have a great um, NPO there working with the community and working with the local government. So that seems really effective. But um, yeah, definitely from all over Japan. I would love to get things started in Hiroshima. Of course, of course. Yeah. But um, well, one of the things that I've uh, been working on recently, we did it this year, we didn't do it last year. So last year on the Sunday morning in, in Nakatsugawa, we did a pottery workshop, uh, which is quite a ni nice thing to do. And people just make what they want to make. And sometimes they come up with interesting ideas that, um, again, are the seeds of a potential social business or something like that, which is great. But um, I re realize that what actually happens when we go out there in the summer is that on the Saturday, there's a festival, there's a snow festival in the summer. They have a snow storehouse. They bring snow out of the snow storehouse, oh, put it wow. out on a green space, and then people do things like sumo and treasure hunting in the snow. Um, and it's a lot of fun for a, you know, a hot Saturday afternoon. Uh, but there we were on Sunday morning sitting in this place doing our, our pottery workshop, and I was thinking, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of people out there in the festival site putting that stuff away. Um, and in fact, when I say a lot of people, there are actually only a few people because there aren't many people in the village to do that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, and so absolutely. I thought last year, well, okay, next year, I'm going to see if we can actually work with the people clearing up the festival site. Yeah, exactly. And we did it this year. That's awesome. And, and, and that, is I that think a, is, a nice way for people to connect to locals as well? It just, it completely, people talk about, you know, it takes so long to earn, you know, local trust and so on. Bam. It, yeah. was, just, it was right there. We were visibly working alongside and yeah. it's just that, that the, it's the optics apart from anything else. There we are. It, there is no pretense or anything about this. We are working alongside people in the community solving a problem that they want solved. Yeah. And they were very grateful. And we were very grateful for the opportunity to be able to do it because it just, it really gave us a sense of, well, we've done at least something yeah. um, that we can remember for the community before Definitely. we left. Definitely. Definitely. I found that for the plastic cleanup projects every month, cleaning up the riverside, cleaning up the beaches. Mm. If you, you know, you get residents, you get tourists to just come out for an hour. And yeah. we haven't had that many local Japanese people yet. But, mm. you know, if you get people doing some common goals, some yes. common task, yeah. which has to be done, which mm. helps the local community. Yeah. And we're just working together on that task. It's not, I don't know, it just seems more more natural exactly. that yeah. they can interact yeah. with locals because yeah. it's not it's not created as a tourist product right it's mm. it's just something that needs to be done that helps uh, yeah. communicate yeah. well i mean again that that word help is one that i've got a bit of a, a reaction to these days you know i'm trying wherever possible to edit it out of my speech because uh, i don't want to be there to help yeah you know i, I just want to be there help. As another member of the community, so yeah. uh, in Japanese, I use the hand. We often say in the yeah. in the so, cleanup things, right? To just come out and lend a hand. Lend a hand, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's a very good way of saying it, yeah. But I, I also say karisom uh, means so uh, uh, kind of temporary villager, okay, uh, and uh, or just a temporary member of the community, uh, because uh, you know, and I I have to admit that I had this myself when I first went out there. I didn't think I was um, thinking in in a way that was superior. But simply because you come there from the city, there's something yeah. that goes on where essentially you're sort of thinking, oh, they should be doing it this way. Yeah. Oh, and they Definitely. shouldn't be doing it that way. Yeah. Uh, but, Absolutely. Uh, That's so true. And, and I, I visited Kamikatsu a few times in Tokushima, a really small town, 1,500 population, 
Now you said you've got 200 something population in some of the places you work at, yeah. but the Kamikatsu is so mountainous, you don't actually see that many people in the city center. Hmm. But when I would go and eat at the local, you know, sh what is it, sh Shokudo or something, yeah. and I would meet some of the local people who came down to the waste recycling center because it's central to the town. Hmm. And I would always make a point to talk to them and ask them, you know, how do they feel about the garbage sorting? Because they now have 45 different categories, right? Yeah. And, and I always praise them and say, <laughs> amazing, you guys, and I did, and I did. And then they turn around and what? This foreigner who lives in Japan, she likes that we have to do that? Like it's so mendoksai and everything. But whenever I praise them, they really open up to me and tell me stories and, you know, about their lives and what they like about the town and stuff. Yeah. So definitely coming off of my hurdle as a university professor or a researcher or even just an international visitor, yeah. coming down to the level where I'm praising them as locals and you guys are amazing, sorted yeah. into 45 categories. That really helps. Oh, it, oh, it absolutely does, yeah. Uh, yeah. And another thing that I found that uh, was a big kind of breakthrough moment for me in that community was um, I was going out there regularly enough that I was beginning to pick up the local news um, uh, when it happened. And uh, so I was able, after visiting the hotel one day, I, was, I ran into somebody else I knew in the community, and I said, um, oh, so so-and-so has just finished at the hotel. And she said, no, because she hadn't heard about this. <laughs> And she said, you know what the truth is? She, then she said, then I got the gossip. She's going, you know what's really happening, don't you? you know. <laughs> At that point, you I thought, okay. Coming. You're a local villager, you know? Yeah, that's, really that's a great term. Yeah, right, yeah. So suddenly that was it. You know, I brought in the gossip before the gossip was known to that person. And there you are. You, yeah. Now you're, you're actually right there in the community. Um, and that, I mean, you, it, it, you, certainly you cannot do that on your first visit to one of these communities yeah. and it's not kind of a realistic goal. But uh, that moment, I suddenly thought, yeah, I really belong. Yeah. Um, this is uh, now part of actually part of my identity, part of my life. Um, I am a member of this community when I'm here. That's uh, wonderful. Yeah. But it's uh, it's also do very... Do you remember your name or do they refer to you with a, a term of any sort or do they uh, remember your name adam son or uh i don't know what they call me when i'm not there they probably call me Aitsu. i don't know but uh the uh, second the third time i visited kamikazu they started calling me omoshiroi gaikokujin <laughs> <laughs> and i thought that yes i will take that that's okay the interesting <laughs> foreigner you know i i will take that and yeah. I hope the more and more I go back, maybe maybe they'll have a nickname for me or yeah. something closer to my name. But, you know, I'll take that. It's yeah. that, that shows that they're kind of accepting me a little bit, I think. Yeah, so, which is, it's kind see. of interesting to get into these kind of KPIs, like the, the key performance indicators. So one of them is like the speed of gossip. But right. um, uh, another one that I notice when I go out there is that people ignore me. And uh -huh. that, to me, is a really big breakthrough. That it's, is, yeah. You I'm don't get people pointing or talking about you. You're well, just accepted as you belong there. In that community, that's been true from the very beginning. It's one of the special things about that Makatsugawa community. You were talking about the, you know, some communities are a bit more conservative than others. Um, and I, I do not know what the key factors are, other than to say that possibly when people can clearly see that their community has a, a, a dark future or not a bright future, then minds begin to open and they become much more accepting to people from the outside and anybody who might be able to show a new path forward. Um, but uh, just being able to uh, sit in, you know, having lunch or something or an evening meal where I'm just sitting in the corner, you know, drinking my sake or whatever it is. And after a while, it's, oh, you're still there kind of thing. Um, that for me is perfect. You know, I mean, I just really enjoy being ignored. Um, and again, it just makes me feel that, well, there I am, I'm part of the scenery, you know, I'm just part of the woodwork. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. And that's, and that's progress, you know, just getting used to international people being around or people who are different from most locals. That's also, that helps Japanese people with diversity yeah. you know, issues, people in wheelchairs yeah. or...
Absolutely. Now, that's a, another very, very important thing, because you've got so many elderly people out in these tiny villages now, and uh, they're going to have all kinds of um, uh, challenges. Uh, you know, they'll start losing their eyesight. They'll start having hearing problems. Um, they won't be able to move as freely as they were able to move before and so on. And they will probably feel that it will be a burden on the community if they impose themselves with their whatever disability it is that they're challenged by. Um, and so actually learning about inclusion with the villagers uh, has been another aspect of what we try to do. So, for example, we did a workshop where um, we would put on um, uh, blindfolds. Um, what's the other word for them in English? Uh, but anyway, and so um, you wouldn't be able to see and uh, then you would try to eat a meal. So we'd, we'd get out a bento right, and put it in front of them. Oh, no, I know what it was. We had uh, pancakes. Uh, and it was just as simple as putting maple syrup on the pancakes. If you can't see, you've got no idea where the pancakes are. You don't know if you're pouring the maple syrup on the pancakes or on the table. And so you've got somebody who can see sitting across from you offering support. Uh, but it's just to get a sense of, well, what would it be like if I couldn't see and I was eating a meal? Yeah, uh, yeah. And we did that with uh, one or two of the people running a farmhouse B&B. &B. Um, so that they could think from that perspective if somebody who couldn't see came to stay with them. Right. Uh, but everybody learns in that kind of situation. There are constant insights. Um, so again, it really it pulls down any barriers between the outsiders and the insiders. Here we are, we're all having this workshop together and we're all learning stuff that could be very valuable for us um, moving That's forward. Awesome. Is there any medical support or medical services for elderly people or people who get sick? Because that is definitely a reason population is declining so fast mm -hmm. in towns like Kamikatsu. They don't have a hospital. Yeah. They don't have a high school. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's two ends where, you know, people have to leave the town because mm -hmm. they don't have those resources. Yeah. So without changing that infrastructure, which is lacking, Mm -hmm. or having immigration, mm -hmm. I, I don't see how a lot of these rural communities can really survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, those are basic needs, right? Have you seen that in your... Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I, well, one person who was actually uh, a workshop leader in the early years, he died. And um, shortly before he died, he, he, had, he collapsed. And somebody who ran a farmhouse B&B &B just drove him to the local hospital in her own car uh, because that was the only way they were going to get him to the hospital. And that was about a 30 minute drive away. Um, so it's something that's been unspoken in what we've been talking about so far, but I think is incredibly important is the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, the 21st century needs to be in that community with all of the AI, the big data, the, the drones, the, all of the new technologies. Yes. Um, could be applied in these communities in exactly the same way that they're being applied in struggling communities in other parts of the world, in other continents. Yeah. We've got a struggling community in, in the heart of Japan. Yes. Uh, and all of these technologies could be applied there as well. And that's, again, an opportunity for workshops where people from the big city could be thinking about how their great new technologies could be applied outside Japan. But first of all, let's try them in this community and see if it works or not. Yeah. All kinds of opportunities out there. That is, that is so important and so key. And when I visited the Southern Islands in Okinawa, mm. I was hit by the same problem that Kamikatsu is having. They don't have a university. Mm. And then you think technology, mm. e-learning, why yeah. not have a satellite campus mm. for students who want to stay, want to help with agriculture, want to help with the tourist industry, there's such a labor shortage. Why not keep those kids there mm -hmm. where they have the family support and mm -hmm. let them have like a satellite university campus? I mean, yes. using technology, using the 21st century, like you said, is such a key part of developing rural communities, not just for tourism, mm -hmm. but for keeping communities there, just yep. population retainment, right? No, absolutely. They lost the school in Nakatsugawa as well. And one of the last things they did, though, was they appealed um, for students to come and live in the community from other communities. And uh, some came from uh, a city in uh, Saitama. Um, and uh, they started going to school in the local communities. And this is why, this is one reason why they've got so many farmhouse B&Bs now, uh, because local families were um, uh, having these students stay at their homes. Uh, so they understood then, oh, it's OK if we have outsiders come to stay. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things that happened after that was that the kids would start going to the school in the local community and then the parents in 
the city in Saitama would start calling and saying, is everything OK? Uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> because the kids weren't calling. They were having such a great time in this okay. little community up in the mountains that, you know, they completely forgot about home and family. You know, it's a, this is now their family. And they've retained those very strong emotional links with that community. So when they have these festivals, there are always representatives of that city at the festival. So even, again, combining communities in other parts of Japan for um, uh, the benefit of these rural communities is uh, another path forward, I think. Yeah, definitely. One example I've um, come across recently is the Setouchi Triennial oh, yeah. Festival. Mm. And how they have university students going to these islands where they have dwindling populations, mm. taking over the akiya, the disused old buildings, mm. making them into art installations, mm. which then brings tourists from Japan and abroad to come to this art festival and view the rural areas that they normally would have no attraction to. Um, so that's a really great tactic mm. to bring young people out into the rural communities to mm. do some kind of task which is needed, but mm. there's a creative out, outpour mm. for them as well, right? So mm. they personally can like follow their dream mm. and be very creative, but also they learn so much about the local needs of the community and the rural people. And mm. I, I just think that's fantastic. And that seems like something that could be applied to other rural communities around Japan because some of the university students I talked to, I expected they would all be from Kyushu, Shikoku, mm -hmm. you know, Chugoku area, but no, a lot of them come from Tokyo. Mm -hmm. so you've got Tokyo students going all the way down there to do that kind of art exhibit, you know, mm -hmm. and being there, living there for weeks yep. at a time, setting it up. Surely we could do that in Saitama, in Tohoku, in other areas of Japan and have similar levels of success to get yeah. tourists up there. Yeah, so this is something else. I, I started teaching at a university in Tokyo. I was teaching, uh, uh, well, ostensibly I was teaching cross-cultural communication. Uh, and I thought, well, if we're going to do things like comparing Britain and America and America and Japan and so on, it's going to be really boring for everybody. Um, and so um, instead, we started focusing on what's the difference between the university and the town? What's the difference between young people and old people? What's the difference between Tokyo and a place where there's a lot of snow every year? And all of these are cultural differences. Yeah. Um, said, so, and I mean, this is actually what I was always sort of working towards. If you're interested in learning about these things, come with me to the snow festival in February and you'll experience a different culture. And 10 students raised their hands and we went out there. Um, to Nakatsugawa for the snow festival and they did a lot of the, the heavy lifting that the local community really required um, and um, we did that two years in a row the the second year we couldn't get complete funding from the uh, the local prefecture from the Yamagata prefecture um, and so we had to make up the money by doing things like uh, sales of um, uh, souvenirs as a kind of social business and so on uh, that's another story but the students formed a connection uh, with the local community in a way that I wasn't expecting and then last year at the summer festival, the one that I was describing just now, suddenly there were these students from uh, the university and they had decided that, you know, oh, we can't just do the winter festival. We're going to come to the summer one now. So they've and the other key thing is with their friends. So, nice. if it's just you know, like unknown people going as volunteers, it's very, very different from let's all get a car and go out there. Yeah. Uh, so these friends going out together and they've established their own flow now out to the yeah. village. Um, and their own emotional connections with the community. That's just fantastic. And don't you think, I mean, if universities started encouraging students to do that by giving them credit yeah. oh, for yeah. classes mm. as part of their rural community engagement, yeah. that would be a big push. I mean, my kids are going through the IB program right now, the International mm. Baccalaureate, and mm. part of that is the CAS system where mm. they get credit school credit and something they have to do to graduate by engaging with the community, doing volunteer activities, you know, and if university students, high school students were given credit, school mm. credit that they needed to graduate, mm. to go out and do these kind of activities, that mm. might be a big oh, push. That would be a huge, huge step forward, yeah. yeah. And it would, it, again, uh, greatly support the government's own efforts to make the universities more global. Um, Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, but th that's another source of actually these days uh, great talent for me 
is uh, you've got so many English speakers um, at the universities in Tokyo now from other places. Right. Uh, and they're quite often interested in going out to the countryside. Yeah, definitely. Going, yeah. Uh, but we were talking about the JET program. That also is strategically massively important because you've got people all over the country who spend three, four, sometimes five years in a tiny community forming a very strong emotional bond. And then after that, they find they can't get employed in Japan. Yeah. Um, they are real treasures. Yeah, and, yeah. and they're vastly underexploited at the moment. Yeah. Underexploited is the wrong word. I mean, they're, they're, were you a JET at any point? In no, your I wasn't, uh, but uh, I'm employing people who were on the JET program. Uh -huh. um, My husband and I were both JETs. Oh, in, were you? Oh, okay. That's, that was our first introduction to Japan. Ah, well, and we spent in three years in Oita. Oh, yeah. really? Where, where in Oita? I was in Oita City. He was in Beppu. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah, but they're so pretty we... much next door, aren't they? Or, uh, Oita City and Beppu, or am I wrong? Yeah, really close. Yeah. Really mm. close, yeah. Oh, so okay. I, was, I was based in one high school, one junior high in Surusaki, mm. like a really small area outside the main city. Oh, and my, uh, Surusaki. Oh, Surusaki, okay. And mm. my husband was a one shot, so he went, he stayed in an office in Beppu, but then he went out to different schools around the whole area oh, pretty really? much every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it was a great introduction to Japan. Mm. I, I learned my Japanese. I've never improved on since those three years. <laughs> I should have studied more, but I, I had a, a great chance to study. I yeah. mean, the JET program really was a great way, I think, to create ambassadors for Japan. To, I absolutely agree, yeah. Even if people don't stay after that one year or two year or three years, hmm. um, they develop, especially in the rural areas, they develop a real understanding of Japanese culture, Japanese language, yeah. I, I wish they would bring back the JET program more in full force. We we see a lot of the JET program dwindling in our area. Really? And oh. being taken over by private companies, and it's not quite the same. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Without naming names, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so they don't really have that uh, kind of community element if they're uh. working for the company. There, it's more like supply teacher type of situation. But nevertheless, even with the JET program, I think they could be far. They could be much more flexible about how the uh, ALTs engage yeah. with the local community because it's so difficult for me to get access to somebody who wants to join one of the things that I'm doing right. because they have such rigid commitments to certain. Uh, you know, got to be here on Friday. Got to be there. Blah blah blah. You know. Um, and it's not really making the best use of those people, and it's not supporting their motivation. No. So uh, there are various improvements that could be made. Yeah. Is there any way that you could use volunteers who are traveling, like traveling volunteers? Because I have a connection now with a, a woman who runs a global network of people who want to travel and volunteer while they're traveling. Mm. So if I could maybe connect them to you and that might work out. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But I, I um, uh, actually, somebody on the trip this time, he didn't um, label himself a volunteer, but he, he just came along because he wanted to, to be involved in what we were doing. And I think that, um, uh, well, they have a term now, community-based tourism, as well as volunteerism. Right. Uh, the, in Japanese, uh, so you've got like, experience, ex you know, where you go somewhere and you take photographs and you go home, then you, you go somewhere and you do something, like, for example, make pottery and you go home. Um, and then what I've been trying to develop over the last year or so is what I call, well, contribution. Yeah, giving so, back, yeah. Yeah, so kind of a contribution-style tourism. In Japanese, it works quite nicely with, you've got keiken, taiken, and then koken. Yeah, so okay. koken, gatakanko. So uh, contribution-style tourism, which I see as a, potentially a huge wave um, of the future for tourism. Um, and again, it, uh, it links quite well with uh, the millennial generation. A lot of people are now traveling with their young children, and they want those children to have meaningful experiences when they're traveling. Definitely. Uh, and uh, you've got a lot of people, for example, in East Asia who are very focused on education, who want their children to have valuable experiences when they come to a place like Japan. That's yeah. beginning to happen now. Um, and so it's exactly the right timing for the international community to really be getting behind the kind of things that we've been talking about. Definitely. I, I think we could definitely talk uh, more on that, the mm. community development aspect of tourism. And mm. I, I found, especially in areas 
where there is friction between mm. tourists and locals just mm. because of history and heritage, right? And mm. so basically anywhere where there's a military base, for example, mm. Fushima, Nagasaki, because of our history, mm. if we can get international tourism, uh, tourists engaged in some way by picking up plastic litter along the rivers, yeah. by um, engaging with the local community, rebuilding houses, mm. um, not just doing workshops, oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. really mm. doing things with locals that needs to be done. I was I was very active last year with the disaster tourism, you know, mm. like disaster volunteering. Yeah. So I was trying to uh, explain and, and open up how visitors could do that because I kept getting contacted by people abroad who wanted to come over and help yeah. with the disaster cleanup and mm. everything. Mm. So I think if you can or we can create some kind of framework mm. where tourists can come over and then for one day or half a day or a week, they mm. can engage with locals and help on a common need, it's mm. much more meaningful than just going and doing a workshop and going home or visiting tourist sites and taking photos. And I think the kinds of visitors who are coming to Japan now are different and they are looking for something more meaningful. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I mean, just two examples. They're very different, but I think that they're the kinds of things that communities would welcome in many parts of Japan. One of them, I think, for a lot of foreigners would be a dream way to volunteer is actually carrying a mikoshi around the village. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're very short of people in so many communities. Those little festivals are in danger of dying out. And if you could actually have, we need 20 people to help us carry the Mikoshi, you know, who's interested, and you'll get free beer, and you get a free meal, you know. Um, a lot of people would want to do that. Something that maybe not so many people would be interested in doing, but villagers really, really need these days, is uh, cutting the grass around empty homes. Because uh, you've got, um, uh, well, uh, what do you call them, residential communities where one house is occupied, the house next to it is not. But yeah. the vegetation grows between the houses and becomes a fire risk. And then also ticks and insects oh, become yeah. a problem, right? So you've got to cut it down. Somebody's got to cut it down. But yeah. again, they don't have the local resources now. They don't have the local budgets to regularly cut down this grass around empty houses, which aren't the, 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 the government's responsibility anyway. That's uh, true. But, uh, but it's very, so very difficult. Even, to... even if, I mean, as, as tourist volunteers, mm. their visa status, they wouldn't be able to get a salary anyway mm. because of the visa regulations. But if they come in and volunteer to cut grass, volunteer to help take down a derelict building or something the community needs, the community then takes care of them, lets yeah. them have a free place to stay, mm -hmm. uh, free meals, and they get to talk to locals, maybe try a workshop if it's available. You mm -hmm. know, like the community could set up something which is like tourism products, mm -hmm. also get the help that they need for mm -hmm for their social well-being, their community's well-being, right? Mm. Yeah, definitely, there's potential there. There is, and I think that something else that is also very, very important, and I to completely agree that just actually talking about stuff is, is a very, very small part of the solution, and actually doing stuff is far more important, actually. I think this particular conversation is very, very valuable because we can clearly see each other's position and how we might be able to collaborate. And one thing that I think would be really valuable for Japan as a whole and might in fact help with the funding activity for all of our activities would be if, for example, um, you were to set up uh, uh, an annual meeting in a place like Mitarai, where they have a very nice meeting facility, where people like you and me and other people who are engaged with local activities around Japan can share best practice and uh, work out ways to collaborate that will enable us all to uh, move forward um, far more efficiently and effectively in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, so if we could have, it might be in Mitarai one year, then we might have some, might have it in Yamagata the next year, but just have a, a, an annual get together where people who are very active in this sphere can at least get themselves ready for what they're going to do in the year ahead and how they're going to refine their activities and introduce new ideas. Yeah. So uh, would you be prepared That's to move great. that forward? Oh, absolutely. And I don't, I don't even think we would have to put forward the huge cost of renting a huge venue. Like if we, if we just had, you know, some speakers in an outdoor space, mm -hmm. that would be good enough, you know, to just try mm -hmm. to get something together and to have speakers engaged in 
tourism and sustainable tourism mm -hmm. who could talk about the area and and to bring people who are interested in this topic to share their ideas and and exchange ideas and collaborate yes. as well as to bring tourism because of the convention type of tourism mm -hmm. people want to go and listen to the talks live and everything that would be great yeah let's do it Okay, well, I'll put you in touch with those two people I know in Mitarai. Maybe we could try starting there. Yeah. But if it's a place that's more convenient yeah. for you, just do it there, you know. Yeah, um, sounds great. But, uh, I think we should definitely move in that direction. I'm, go I'm going to have to move on. I've got to get yes. something done this morning. Yes, it's yes. Really speaking it's, with you. it's been over an hour. I really appreciate the conversation. So many great ideas have been sparked, and I'm so inspired by your work. And, and by yours. I'm inspired by yours, yeah. Good work. Thank you, you so much. Yeah. Thank you forward to working with you more. I look forward to it. Yep. Thank you very much, Joy. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Bye for now. Bye.